Good morning and welcome back. It's wonderful to see you all again today. I hope yesterday you got off to a great start, just as Sarah suggested with having a chance to see old faces and meet new friends. And certainly we'll continue that with our very full day today. So this morning, I'm pleased to introduce Brittany, who as many of you met yesterday, is the woman behind having all of us here this week. Brittany started in the education department almost a year ago working for the full department and as fabulous as she is we quickly realized that she was the person that could help make this symposium possible and so starting in January she became our education assistant for the reflections program um, really allowing us to host this this week. Brittany is a rising junior here at Duke. She's an art history major, and we're thrilled to have her as part of our department. Brittany? Thanks, Jessica. I'd like to once again welcome each one of you to the National Museum of Art. I'm thrilled that so many museum professionals and others have decided that this type of programming is worth creating and expanding. I'm also glad that we all share the same goal of bringing the community together to share current best practices and successes, as well as areas in which we can improve our programs. As we begin the second day of the symposium, I encourage you to look at the future and think about the ways in which we can collectively grow and expand our programs, both at our own institutions and at those who have yet to provide programs. As a pioneer in the field of dementia programming, the Museum of Modern Art developed the model that many museums use to start their own programs. MoMA began their endeavors in this field in 2007, over 10 years ago. And now it seems time for another wave of new programs and innovations. To reflect on past work and help us plan for this new wave, I'm pleased to introduce Laurel Humble, the Associate Educator for Community and Access Programs at MoMA. Laurel works on prime time, MoMA's initiative to involve older adults more deeply in the life of the museum. She manages outreach to older adult audiences and develops and leads an array of programming for that audience. Previously, Laurel managed MoMA's Alzheimer's Project, developing print and online resources. She is also co-author of the award-winning publication, Meet Me, making art accessible to people with dementia. Please help me welcome Laurel. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Ooh. I am delighted to be here with all of you. I am a daughter of the Triangle region of North Carolina. So thank you so much to Jessica and Brittany and the whole team for having me here and giving me an opportunity to return to some of my favorite Southern foods, biscuits, fried green tomatoes. Um, as a daughter of Chapel Hill, really. More specifically, I would be remiss if I did not mention the 2017 national champions. <laughs> the Carolina men's basketball team, sixth time with that title. Um, I think with this audience in particular, I'm surprised that anyone cares or is even laughing, but it would be a dereliction of my sort of fan duty if I didn't mention it while up here. Uh, no, I'm not here just to talk about my favorite foods and, um, and Carolina basketball, though I could. Um, instead, I'm really here to talk about, of course, our programming for older adults at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And I'll do so today. I'll talk about the origins of Meet Me at MoMA and the programming more specifically for individuals with Alzheimer's disease and their care partners. And then I'll talk about how we've really used that focused endeavor, that focused initiative, and now... Uh, parlayed or, or sort of channeled that into this new initiative at the museum that's about three years old called Primetime, which looks to serve older New Yorkers more broadly and more, more deeply in the life of the museum. But before I start talking, I want to get a better sense of who all is here. And I know we had our small group conversations yesterday, which were great. And I know we had, um, you know, snacks and cocktails and bus rides and things like that. But um, a few questions for you all. How many of you work in an art museum? Oh, wow. Many people. How many of you work in a non-art museum, a different kind of museum? And what are some of the, those other non-art museums that are represented? History. History. Historic House Museum. Historic House. Children's Museum. Children's Museum, yeah. Anyone else? History and Natural History. History and Natural History, great. How many of you have your programs for people with, uh, with Alzheimer's disease already up and running, have been running for quite some time? Phenomenal. How many of you are kind of newer to this scene in the kind of pilot phase? 
New Russian scene and pilot phase. <laughs> great, great. So yeah, so that's a, a pretty significant amount. Um, how many of you work with individual families, individual participants coming from who still live at home in your programming? And how many people work exclusively with care organizations or care facilities? So, or both. Yeah, we can do both. We can do both hands if you want. <laughs> how many of you teach the programs? Great. How many of you oversee programming for other audiences? Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Many hats. <laughs> Um, how many of you feel deeply supported by your institutions in starting this program or working on these programs? That's phenomenal. How many of you have a family member or are personally affected by Alzheimer's disease or another form of dementia? Interesting. How many of you met your first friend with dementia through your programming at your museum? Me too. Yeah. This is very helpful for me in getting a sense of, of who you all are, where you're coming from, kind of where you're at in the development of your programming. Um, and also, I think, just speaks to, and the people in the back had the best view, right, of just the, the breadth of experience that's in the room today. And it's very exciting for me, and I'm really excited to be a part of this conversation. So again, I'll get into MoMA's story, which is very much our story, our institution's story. And I think, um, I hope that as I, as I go through these slides and, and talk about our experience, that we find similarities, but also, of course, differences. And I think that that really speaks, again, to the variety of institutions and experiences that, are, that exist in this room and really across the country and the world. The programs for people with Alzheimer's disease and their care partners really originated in existing outreach programming for senior audiences across the city. And as you can probably tell from this slide, this is not the most recent photo of a program that we've had um, with the slide projector stacked on the milk crates in the middle of a, a nice, small, intimate room. Also, the fashions might be a little bit more, you know, a little more dated. This photo is really from the early 2000s, and in the late 90s, early 2000s, before my time at MoMA, when I was still in Chapel Hill, we were working off-site with the kinds of organizations that you, you know, normally associate with older adults, so senior centers, uh, long-term care facilities. And the, the structure of programs was typically this kind of lecture, right? A, a very stand-and-deliver type conversation or... or um, lecture around art history exhibitions, artists represented in the collection. And through that work, we realized that in, in going off-site and working in these settings, we were inadvertently, you might say, working with individuals with Alzheimer's disease. If you think about the rising trends, the demographic shift, just the, the prevalence of this particular disease within the older adult population, this was a part of that audience that we were not necessarily serving in the best way that we could. And so it behooved us to learn more about Alzheimer's disease um, and, and adjust our teaching strategy you know, accordingly to, to better suit this audience. So the pilot period before we launched Meet Me at MoMA was from about 2003 to about 2005. Um, and in that time, we worked with a particular assisted living facility with our educators going off-site and um, residents from that facility coming to the museum. We also did a pilot program with support groups from the Alzheimer's Association, and then we had our educators go through training with Mount Sinai School of Medicine. The woman who ran that training was just phenomenal. Her name was Dr. Meg Sewell, and she was so good at, at you know, she gave the background information about what is Alzheimer's disease, you know, how does it sort of manifest in, in, the, in the brain, but then at the same time, how does it really manifest in terms of cognition and communication, more specifically? Because that is really right, the heart of, of education, right? It's communication. So she emphasized that especially, and that was really helpful for our educators. Here's one of the photos from the early pilot program. And I'll just say quickly that our educators are all paid freelancers, paid contractual educators. Many of them are teaching artists like Carrie Downey here on the left. They are individuals who already come to the museum with a breadth of experience in working with different audiences around the city, people with varying levels of experience with art and museums, people of varying ages, people with varying um, abilities and disabilities. They have different professional backgrounds too. There's teaching artists, some people have an art education background, some people have an art historical background. But what really unites them is their just general interest in different kinds of people, right? And I think, and that they don't approach this as a, a charitable act. That this is really 
um, about rights and who has access, who doesn't have access. It's not about doing a service to those who are you know, less fortunate. And that feeds into the tone, obviously, of all the programs that we teach. We also have a rule in our department, the education department, that when you dress the same as somebody, you have to take a photo, which is <laughs> the reason we snapped this photo. I think Ty was generally not sure why we were so intent on documenting this particular moment, but you know, there are clearly affinities regardless. Meet Me at MoMA, then, is our, our monthly program for individuals who still live at home. It launched in January 2006. It was originally sort of designed or, or marketed towards uh, individuals with early to mid-stage Alzheimer's disease coming with a care partner, be it a family care partner or a professional care partner. And when we launched in January of 2006, we initially advertised through the MoMA membership base, thinking that this would be an audience that um, was already familiar with the museum and had that relationship and might be looking for an opportunity to continue that relationship in a way that was better suited to their needs and in a space they knew that was designed for them. Um, and the MoMA membership then was about like 100,000 people, uh, and about 20 people came to the program. <laughs> so, you know, we started very small as well. And uh, with those 20 people, we worked with about two, you know, had two groups go in to the galleries initially. And then the program really grew from there. Um, and I'll just say, these are quickly the, the goals of the programming, Meet Me at MoMA, the monthly program, um, but also all the offsite and partnership work that we continue to do with care facilities. Um, and I guess I'll just say them quickly because I just noticed everybody started jotting things down. <laughs> um, so to explore, which I say in the sense of we're, we don't have a, a, an end destination in mind. And I'm sure this is something that you all um, share in your teaching approach, right? that we don't need to get to a certain destination. It's more about, as a group, using the, the group's input to determine the direction of the conversation and being really open in that way. To share and encourage sharing of opinions, of, um, of thoughts, of personal experiences, you know, side to side to one another, but also, of course, with the educator and the larger group. Um, to connect with one another and sort of reconnect um, and, and continue to strengthen those social bonds that are really tested and challenged through uh, a disease like this. And then I'm so happy that Damon mentioned yesterday the way your social role can really quickly change when someone in your family uh, receives a diagnosis and how you can go from being a son one day to you know a power of attorney and part of a medical team. It was really beautiful the way that you articulated that yesterday. And so part of the program is about transcending these newly acquired social roles, right? and getting back to kind of that equilibrium or that balance or that more, yeah, just equal relationship that uh, families experience or had. Um, of course, to imagine, and I think part of that, you know, part of the transcendence comes through that imagination as well, thinking about worlds and ideas and experiences beyond our own, um, which has a, a lot of power, I think, for any individual. And of course, to continue to grow and develop which is not necessarily a, a word that is, I think, used with this particular population, right? That you have, still have opportunities to grow and develop as a human. Um, and I would say one that's not listed here, but that is fundamental to our program, and I think what really sets museum programming apart is the idea of challenge, right? That we're challenging people, um, again, to confront ideas or um, notions or, or what have you that are outside of their day-to-day. -day. And, and I think that, again, that's something that you can do in a, in a museum setting or with art um, in a safe way, but in a way that, again, pushes people. And, and that's something that, you know, that kind of, I think there's so much fear of, of challenging somebody and ha them having a negative reaction or putting them in a position that they're not comfortable with. Or, and of course, we don't want to make anyone uncomfortable. But that challenge is, I think, a fundamental part of the program and is part of what enables continued growth. So in 2006, also in 2006, uh, September 2006, there was an article in the Times about the program, and that led, um, almost a year later, to a generous grant from the MetLife Foundation to support what this broader outreach initiative called the MoMA Alzheimer's Project, which is what I was hired to work on in 2007 at the museum. The funding from MetLife started as a two-year 
grant and then became a two, four year grant and then a five and then a six and a seven year grant, much to the um, pleasure of my parents who are actually here today who are delighted that I could stay employed at the museum during the economic downturn. Uh, <laughs> And I was very pleased as well. Um, the funding from MetLife really allowed MoMA to be a, a generous institution in a way that I think museums aren't always. I mean, this is an incredible, generous gathering, really, supported by the Nasher. But, um, you know, I think museums often can be a little bit proprietary about their endeavors. And so this really allowed us to develop, uh, to dedicate the resources, be it staff or, or just financial resources, to sharing our experiences and bringing people together around this topic. The Alzheimer's Project and the MetLife funding allowed us to create this resource, which came out in 2009, which some of you may be familiar with. Um, and then also, of course, the website, which in, I think also came out in 2009 and has been developed and added to in the time since, um, including videos of, of programs in action, um, videos that highlight perspectives from other colleagues from around the world who have also started programs in very different settings. Um, and their, their approach and experience and, you know, highlighting both the differences but also the shared mission that I think all of us share. We also traveled <laughs> extensively for various workshops, conference presentations, educator meetings, etc. This is over the course of the seven years of the grant, so working with 380 different museums and 13,000 people through conference presentations and um, museum or educator workshops. And those conference presentations weren't just within the museum sector, and I think that's an important thing to highlight. We also were presenting, sometimes sort of out of our league, at, um, at big international um, public health conferences and, and other health-related conferences, trying to illustrate the, the importance of this kind of programming on that side of thing and kind of pull those stakeholders into the conversation as well, right? Um, and then facilitating 150 workshops in 25 states and 17 countries. This is um, not a map of where we traveled to. <laughs> I would have the most amazing miles if I was to log all these flights. This represents places that have started programs, places that we have traveled to, and then also places that have accessed the, the training videos and other resources online. You can see, right, that this is really a global movement um, of, of people who are interested in doing this kind of work in their particular setting or community. Another big component of the Alzheimer's Project was the research that we did. The first study was with NYU School of Medicine with Dr. Mary Middleman, who was the principal investigator. That took place in 2008. And I know we have a research panel um, coming up this afternoon, so I won't go into detail too much about the research that we did. Um, I'll talk a little bit more, I think, instead about how it changed our kind of conception of the program or you know, what has sort of shifted in terms of our own ideas about the program. But it focused on first-time participants, individuals with early stage Alzheimer's disease coming to the program for the first time with a family partner. And it looked really at quality of life outcomes. Quality of life outcomes both for the participant with dementia and for the caregiver. And then also tried to engage in some way any kind of shift or impact on the relationship between the two. We, thinking of the goals before about that equilibrium and being able to participate as equals, trying to see what, what benefits that might have had. These are some of the quality of life outcomes that came out of that. When Meet Me at MoMA was originally conceived, it was thought of primarily as a program for the participant with dementia, and then the caregiver or the care partner was a, um, not secondary, but you know was, and I think you see that, right, in programs too, where people will sort of step back and they're like, no, this program is for, is for my husband or what, what, what have you. And this study really helped us and, and, and put it in quite clear terms that the strength of the program was that it was for both people equally. Um, and it was great to learn that in 2008, you know, two years after the program started, because now we've been able to really internalize that all throughout the last 10 years of the program. And for this third bulleted point, um, the increase in social support, that finding came from one of the quality of life scales that the care partners filled out. And, and pardon me if you've heard me say this before, but the scale was filled out directly before the program in a week following. and. The question that this finding relates to asked, how many good friends do you feel like you have that you can rely on or, or get assistance with in your kind of daily caregiving duties? And, um, and the number went up in a week by almost three friends, by like 2.8 whole friends, you know, like trunk eight in arm. Um, which is amazing, right? If you think about it, that of course nobody 
develop three new close friendships in one week that they could then you know, rely on for all these challenges that they're experiencing in their day-to-day life. But if you feel like you have a better sense of social support, you feel like you might be able to ask for help with something, that that's kind of the best you can hope for. And that's something that has, because it was such a, I mean, it was, it was such a powerful finding for us, it's something that we have really tried to emphasize and include in all programs after this. Um, and that's another important point, and I think we'll talk about this, and if I really get going, I'll talk about it a lot this, this afternoon in the research panel, that, um, that there's so many important things that we can look at through research around this programming that have implications, of course, right, to other audiences. And I think it behooves us to also look at those um, synergies so we don't just sort of silo this audience in this particular way. This list comes directly from the take-home evaluations that uh, both participants filled out and them identifying aspects of the program that had the, br- the biggest impact on their experience. Um, and hands down, it was the educator, which I think to a room of educators doesn't seem super surprising, but, um, but, is, but is really the constant, right, between all these programs. And I think we think about how can I adjust or plan for all these logistical issues and whatnot, but it's really about you and the, the experience that you create. Um, and so this has been, it was kind of validating one, and then really helpful to have this directly from participants as we were doing all these workshops with other educators to say that, you know, the power lies within you to create this experience within the museum. And so this, that study took place in 2008, and again, it really looked at the impact of the program on the participants, on quality of life for the participants, and specifically, you know, with this kind of narrow audience, individuals with uh, with early stage Alzheimer's disease and a family care partner. But one just side note that I would like to bring up, and I'm sure you all have experienced too, and I think is a real strength of the program, but isn't necessarily something that's studied or evaluated, is the fact that, for, for in my mind, this is one of the most, the group that you have in, in a Meet Me at MoMA type program is one of the most varied and kind of diverse in every sense of the word, right? So you have a range of ages. You have older adults who can you know, be 65 or, even, or younger at times to their 90s. You have um, adult children who participate. Sometimes we have grandchildren, though that's r- relatively um, infrequent. Then you have individuals with varying cognitive ability, right? You have people who have lots of experience visiting museums. You have people who are coming to this programming at a museum for the first time because they're just looking for something to do, right? You have people who are so excited to be there. You have people who didn't sign themselves up, who got signed up and don't really want to be there. You have family relationships and family dynamics. You have professional dynamics, right, with individuals who are really working for someone, and and in New York especially, a lot of the professional caregivers are Caribbean immigrants or immigrants from the Philippines, and so you have racial and ethnic backgrounds that are really very, people of just different ages. It's such a mix, right? Um, Which is in some ways why it's such an exciting and and fun program to teach, Um, but also I think that that diversity and that complexity gets sort of minimized through some of the research we do when we try and pare down all these variables. Um, so that is my note, and I'm sorry to my parents who are both public health professionals who probably wouldn't appreciate my challenging the idea of minimizing variables. Uh, so the other thing I mentioned before too that there are so many benefits, not obvious, not just for the, the participants, but also for us as, as educators, as um, professionals, and our institutions as well, right, uh, for, for establishing programs for this audience. And so a few years into the project, we wanted to try and look at some of the other programs that existed around the country and try and gauge or, or, or in some way assess the positive impact that those programs had had on the professionals who were developing them, the institutions that were hosting them, and those kind of community relations with, uh, for those various institutions. Um, and I won't go into all of these points at all, but I will just note a couple of, of ideas that I think are probably very familiar and relatable and not in any way groundbreaking, but very helpful to have in writing from you know a visitor research specialist. That these programs also are not just siloed within the education department, that they require cooperation and and work with so many other members of the museum, right? So many other departments, security, visitor services, curatorial, um, marketing and communications. And so through this like very specific educational endeavor, we have a uh, opportunity for this broader ripple effect that um, that sort of permeates outside of outside of just our one particular 
area. Um, and that there was a lot of positive kind of external recognition for, for museums that started this program, which doesn't sound like great to say out loud because you want to think you're just doing this program because it deserves to exist. But in these early days especially, I think it was helpful for museums to know that you could see an increase in press around this kind of program. You could see p funding specifically for this area, because I think there is interest in funding programming specifically for people with Alzheimer's disease and their care partners. Um, so that there are these sort of, the message that something like this can communicate externally, especially if you have a good team working on it, um, has an impact as well. Those are our two big studies. Um, well, one was very big, one was smaller. And then, of course, we continued to collect anecdotal feedback from participants. And we did an art making pr program a few years ago. Um, and simultaneously, the museum had this broader advertising or marketing campaign going where they would give people uh, these little slips and then just see what they wrote. And then they wrote down where they were from and their age. And, um, and it was amazing to see the responses. But we decided that you know our participants should also be reflected in this marketing campaign. And this was just one of the most delightful responses. So concise, so to the point, so effective. Um, and then so the last thing that the, the Alzheimer's Project and the MetLife funding enabled us to do was to also host gatherings very similar to this one, to bring together like-minded colleagues working across various sectors to explore their practice, to you know kind of develop a collective brain trust around this. Um, and uh, this is from a, a, the Bauhaus staircase at the museum. And when I look at this photo, I, it still makes me happy, not, not just because you know I'm in it, but, um, but because I see people from Colorado, from Ireland, from Queens, um, from Australia, from Norway, from Wisconsin, there's, uh, from Italy, there's really just from Toronto. There's just such a mix, right? There's, there's so much interest around this, and it, it's a real point of pride, really, that um, that we were able to, to cultivate this group and, and bring them together to explore their work. And this just is another example of that. You have a colleague named Yoko Hayashi who works in Tokyo primarily, though really across Japan, who has developed a training program and works with all sorts of educators from different backgrounds to, to facilitate programming offsite in care organizations, but also to teach programs within museums, especially in the Tokyo area. And then Philippa Troutman, who is from like rural, 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 um, <laughs> northern England. Um, and the folks can come together and, and have, you know, of course, they're, they're like-minded. They have a, this shared interest, and they can learn from each other, despite the fact that they're operating in just completely different cultures and settings and whatnot. Um, and this is just one quote that I also found very touching and, and I agreed with from one of the um, participants from the 2013 exchange that we did, which is also, I'll read out loud. I came away from the exchange feeling like I am part of a great global community of people who are as passionate about connecting through art forms and serving humanity as I am. I am not alone. And in future projects, I have many colleagues I can reach out to for inspiration. I love the non-hierarchical feel of the project exchange. And I think that this event is clearly right a continuation of this, um, this tradition and just expands it even more. It's really amazing. So um, the MetLife funding came to an end in 2014. So we no longer have the uh, staff positions and just the general funding to do a lot of that broader outreach to, to travel to, you know, Timbuktu or wherever, um, to, to facilitate workshops and whatnot. But we still continue to do programming, of course. For the New York community, we have Meet Me at MoMA still happening on a monthly basis. We still uh, do by request visits to the museum from local care organizations, and then also continue to work offsite through um, by request programs and long term partnerships with different care organizations, long term care facilities, and day programming across the five boroughs. And with that, I think before I move on to prime time, I just want to pause here, see if there are questions. Is there any topic? Yeah. So uh, I know that your program started by having your tours with uh, visitors with Alzheimer's and their care partners come in on Mondays when the museum is closed. Yes. And I know you also said that it's so important to show the community that we're working with this particular Yes. Community. Have you switched to going outside of Mondays so they're in the galleries and other visitors are in the galleries? Yes, we not by choice, but yes, yeah. So it, yes, we used to do the program on the day that the museum was closed to the public, which was really, I mean, 
it was a dream. I think people enjoy the kind of quiet VIP feeling experience. Um, as an educator, it's just much more pleasant to teach when you don't have the public like careening around you and snapping photos and, you know. Um, but then the museum about five years ago opened seven days a week. So now we do the program when the museum is open to the general public. And it's been, you know, I think we were really concerned that the experience was going to be compromised in a, in a way. And, and it's been fine, um, which has been a, a reassuring thing. So I think you're right that it is important for people to see who, you know, who, who can come to the museum, the kinds of conversations you can have. Obviously, I don't think general public visitors know that this is a program specifically for individuals with Alzheimer's disease, um, but they can see that it's an older adult group and, um, and, and they, you know, want to participate in the conversation and that's pretty amazing, right? Because how many people are like trying to get into a conversation? I think it also makes the, the group, the visitors with Alzheimer's feel like they're normalized. Yes, yeah. I totally agree. Yeah, that you're just part of the general public who's coming. So, the, I mean, the slight adjustments that we've made is that the groups are a little bit smaller. And we really try and emphasize for educators to go to quieter parts of the museum, which sometimes are really hard to find. Um, but I think you're, you're really right. It's, it hasn't been a, as much of a lo kind of logistical challenge as we thought it was going to be. And I think that the positives really outweigh the negatives. Thank you for asking. Are there other questions? Yeah. You, you mentioned about a uh, by request program. Mm -hmm. Could you just talk a little bit more about that? And do the um, LTC folks pay, or is that a service that's offered by them? Yeah, so all the programming for people, all access programs in general, and actually prime time as well, are free. Um, so including by request or partnership programming with um, long-term care facilities and day programming, day, day programs and, and uh, similar organizations. So those take two forms. The, the by request programs, um, usually what happens is, a, a, you know, a dedicated person at that organization will get in touch with the museum and say, I'd like to, you know, organize a visit. We'll suggest a three-part program. I'm sure this is similar for a lot of you in your work, where um, our educator will full, first go off-site, uh, facilitate a conversation, maybe do a little bit of art making. Then the group will come to the museum for a tour, and then we'll go back off-site and facilitate um, usually an art making, a more involved art making project. Though sometimes it's just a one-time visit, um, which is fine. It's really about what the organization can do and what they want. And then we have about, I think between, this is a general number, between five and 10 um, long-term partnerships with um, long-term care facilities, primarily uh, around the five boroughs, M maybe not Staten Island. Sorry, Staten Island. Uh, yeah. In these different programs, where would you say that people are, are on the spectrum of memory loss sure. in the variety of programs yeah. you just described? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that question because I should have brought it up. So it really ranges. For for the Meet Me at MoMA program, you know, as I mentioned before, it was originally advertised as for individuals. It still is advertised this way as for early individuals with early stage Alzheimer's disease to moderate stage. Um, but of course, people come and they love it and they continue to come. So we do have, I would say, about. 10, 20 percent of people who have progressed to a kind of more late moderate late stage um, and we've adjusted a little bit in to to um, address that or, or to, to kind of adjust our teaching strategies in that way for the programs in long-term care organizations um, people tend to be further along definitely more along the kind of moderate to, to late moderate um, stages so there yeah there's there's a kind of spectrum that you're touching on is that Yes, so just one short follow-up. When the people that are in residential facilities come for the visit, mm -hmm. right, because you still have that three structure. Yes. Do you, I'm very familiar with the practice, I read your book, and um, visit mm -hmm. and observe. Do you adjust your teaching strategies during the visit for people further along on the spectrum? Yes, absolutely. And I think, you know, this came up in the small group conversation I had yesterday about when, like, you can have kind of ideas about who is in your group and then you, people walk in or you walk into a space and you just adjust really on the spot, which is, again, to what Damon was saying about creativity. I think educators are some of the most cre creative people um, on the planet. Um, so, yeah, so you do kind of adjust. And I think some of the differences is about the sort of... Um, the speed of the conversation, um, the amount of sort of like tactile or other sensory experiences, 
um, or you know um, components of the experience. Um, I'm trying to think if there are other specific ones, but I imagine other people would have things to say about it too in the conversations later today. Yeah. Do you have the same? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Please. Do you have the same people leading the discussions in the museum that you do doing the art projects as well? Yes. Yeah, the same group, about 12 to 15 educators teach all the programs, and they teach across community and access programs, so yeah. Was there another question in the front? Yes. So you talked about having a high request and then a volunteer facilities, but I think you also have a, a, a monthly request that you have a group, is that correct? Yeah. And I'm curious about that group, uh, are you, is it, is it the same people that are coming mm -hmm. back month after month? How do you manage that to allow for as much access as sure, possible. that's a great question. So right, for Meet Me at MoMA, it is drop-in or you know, it's pre-registration, so we know who's coming in advance. And I would say, um, and I think other people in New York might have similar thoughts on this, um, that you do see a lot of the same participants coming back every month, um, which is great, because you really get to develop a relationship and you know that the museum is a, a part of their life, which feels good, you know? Um, and And for us, so the program, as I mentioned, we started with about 25 participants. At its peak, when there was so much press and kind of conversation really generated a lot by the outreach, um, we had to cap it. And we had six, sometimes seven groups go into the museum of about 14 people. So it was really big. Um, and since then, our numbers have sort of moved back down. So now we have about five, sometimes six groups of 10, 10, 11, 12. Um, and we have hesitated to do more outreach. We, we haven't had to have a wait list or anything, so we're, we're operating at like a surprisingly okay equilibrium. Um, and we have hesitated to do more outreach because just for our logistical reasons, the museum is undergoing construction and galleries are closing and lobbies are closing and whatnot. So we have sort of kept our numbers where they, where they are and haven't done a big outreach push, but I think we will do so in the f spring. <laughs> We'll see. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Okay. Yes, yeah, Susan. Um, could you, when you say that you have 10 to 12 participants in the group, is that 10 to 12 um, participants with a diagnosis and their care partners? It's 10 to 12 total. 10 to 12. Yeah. So usually about five individuals with Alzheimer's disease and then six or seven caregivers or care partners because some people um, come with both a family care partner and, yeah, and a professional one. One last question, then I'll move on to prime time. What's yeah. A, how, what's the time frame for this? For the tours and the, yeah. So um, for the offsite visits, it's usually about an hour, um, maybe an hour and 15 minutes. But I think because of logistics of working offsite and spaces and, um, and sort of attention and, you know, all those things, it's a little bit shorter. And in the galleries for the tours, it's usually, if it's with a group coming from, a, from an outside organization, it's also usually about an hour, but for Meet Me at MoMA, it's about an hour and a half. Um, and, you know, sometimes we'll go an hour and 15 minutes, sort of, again, feeling out the group and who, what you want to do. But that's what we budget time-wise. Okay, I will move on to prime time, but I'm sure there'll be time for more questions and, and thoughts and comments after this and throughout the next couple of days. Prime time is, is a newer, slightly newer, about three years, initiative to better engage older New Yorkers in the life of the museum. Um, and it grows directly out of our work with this more special, specialized, targeted, you know, smaller group of individuals with Alzheimer's disease and their care partners, but um, very much inspired by the sort of spirit of that initiative. Through Primetime, we hope to support a fulfilling aging process, one that is defined by curiosity, connectivity, curiousness, and continued growth, that continued growth idea again. And this initiative is very much focused on the New York City community, which is part of the reason that it's been supported so wonderfully by the museum is because it is really looking at the five boroughs and trying to um, better serve our, our local New Yorkers. Here's one of our most phenomenal prime timers, Vivian in the middle and her grandson, some of our educators. Um, I think this photo really encapsulates the spirit of, of prime time, and, um, and this is from the launch event, which I'll talk about more in a little bit. Um, but also, you know, why now? Why were we looking at older adults? Or why were we thinking about this audience? In part, again, it was because we had been uh, working 
on programming for individuals with Alzheimer's disease and their care partners. And then through that, you know, you get exposed to this much broader conversation about creative aging and lifelong learning. And we were looking at ways of sort of expanding our work in that regard. Of course, there's a massive demographic shift underway, which I know we talked about some in my small group yesterday, that pretty soon by 20, uh, 50 older adults will outnumber all children under the age of 14, which is incredible. Um, and that in New York right now, there are a million individuals 65 and up. It's like 1.4 or almost 1.5 million individuals 60 and up. And you know, those numbers, it you, depends on who you ask, you know, how you want to define an older adult. Um, and that it's growing at six times, or sorry, six times the rate of the total population, faster than any group in New York City. So there's obviously an incredible um, opportunity that, that exists to better reach out to this portion of the New York population. We also noticed that this might be a kind of ripe pregnant moment in terms of so much conversation in the media around aging. This is a relatively new blog on the New York Times called The New Old Age. PBS for any P PBS devotees, and I can think of at least two. I was raised in a PBS household. Um, has the the Next Avenue site where they, it's you know a news and lifestyle site for, I think the individuals 60 up is how they sort of define it. But again, these are fuzzy numbers, um, and we noticed some you know less maybe intellectual, less news related, but still in the media, trends um, around elevating older adults. And of course, this is BFFs, Carly Kloss, and Iris Apfel. And coincidentally, the woman on the left happens to work at MoMA, um, which was had nothing to do with us. She just was fashionable enough for Kate Spade, I guess. Um, but also, this guy, look at this guy in the back. Um, so what a life you could live if you purchased Kate Spade products and <laughs> Uh, could find yourself connected to Iris at Um But yeah, so you know, I think we did. We, at the same time that this ad came out, Joni Mitchell was on the cover of New York, uh, New York Magazine. You know, there were just so many kind of glaring signs that, that there was interest and in maybe support for this particular area of programming. Um, of course, New Yorkers are part of, or sorry, older adults are part of the New York community. I mentioned those numbers before, but they're not often um, depicted as these four women are as individuals, right? As vibrant individuals with personalities and, you know, varying taste <laughs> and style. This is a photo from the, I guess, photographer, uh, Ari Seth Cohen, who has a blog called Advanced Style, which I would encourage anybody to check out. Um, he also had a movie that was on, it was on Netflix for a while. I think they've taken it off. And we hired him to come in and do these promotional photos in advance of our launch, just knowing that he would be able to, again, kind of capture that vitality and, and kind of positive spirit that can exist within aging. Um, and of course, that older artists are part of our collection. Um, and we're a modern and contemporary museum. We have living artists, many of them, who have aged. Um, and, and so why are we, we, it's like we almost kind of forgot that they existed in a way. Um, so of course, Yayoi Kusama, another very stylish older woman. And so, the last thing I'll just say about why, why older adults and kind of why now was that we noticed all these external trends, right? Um, but also noticed that internally within our museum, you know, in theory, older adults are part of the adult audience. Um, like, why do you need to create siloed or separate programming? This is part of the adult audience. But in fact, they were really underrepresented, and we wanted to understand why and get a better sense of what exactly were the barriers or, or perceived barriers that were keeping people out of programming or just the museum in general. And to give you one number, 6% of all tickets sold to New Yorkers, so people within the five boroughs, are sold to older adults. Um, so it's a, I mean, that's tickets, so that's not membership. When I think the membership, we don't have very, we don't have a lot of data on who our members are in terms of age. Um, but that's a really small amount, right? So in order to start prime time and kind of explore these ideas more, more, um, more in depth. We engaged in the first pilot year that was really focused on research um, and did a number of things. So we had needs assessment meetings with a number of colleagues from around the city, especially who worked in aging and aging services. So social workers, individuals who worked in settlement homes, in senior centers, case managers who worked in um, NORCs, 
nationally occurring retirement communities, which is a phenomenal acronym, which, which exists in the city where you have these um, living centers. A lot of them are public housing that people moved into after the war, during that housing boom, and people just stayed. And so now you have a 2,000 unit building that is almost entirely inhabited by individuals 65 and up. So that there's a big push to um, provide services and case management in those, those settings. Um, we were, were met with the Department for the Aged, who oversee a number of the senior centers in the city, uh, with the Department for Cultural Affairs, who has a broad cultural plan, which includes older artists, um, and have an, an entire initiative called Sukasa, um, which is uh, developing artist residencies in senior centers across the five boroughs geriatricians, gerontologists, we, we try to meet with anybody who would sit down with us, often luring them with food, as we talked about <laughs> yesterday, food being social currency, um, and, and really learn from their experience working in the city. We also did um, a quote-unquote literature review, which I put these quotes around it because I think that's kind of generous in terms of the, the um, formality of the endeavor, but really trying to look at broad issues in geriatrics and gerontology and looking at cultural participation um, and kind of also health and wellness outcomes from cultural participation, um, which is there's a kind of growing body of research around that. A lot of it is focused on dementia and, and Alzheimer's disease, but there, there are some kind of broader uh, studies that look at older adults in general. And these are just some of the interesting findings that were very relevant to us, but also highlighted some potential issues that we could address through our programs. Um, so the idea that 45% of adults 65 and up are divorced, separated, or widowed, which I didn't realize. Um, and that in New York City, 30% of older adults live alone. And there's a real risk of social isolation that comes with you know, not working and having that social connection, um, not cohabitating, <laughs> or not being partnered in some way. And then these stats I thought were incredibly surprising, that nationally only 3.5% of the 65 up population live in some kind of residential facility. I think the assumption you know, in our culture is that all older adults are just housed away in, in facilities. Um, and that even more surprising to us was that only 3% of older New Yorkers utilize senior centers. And I mentioned before at the very beginning of the presentation that when we first were doing this work in the late 90s, early 2000s, we were primarily working in long-term care facilities and senior centers. And so if we're like just gonna put these numbers together, that's reaching potentially like a 6%, right, of the, of the New York population. So our charge was to think, you know, more creatively about how we could reach out to older New Yorkers and meet them in the places where they actually wanted to be taking part in programming. The final part of the research was a um, was the convening of a primetime collective, which was a group of 11 older New Yorkers, um, again, from all boroughs except for Staten Island. It's really hard, for those of you who have not visited New York, it's really hard to get from Staten Island to the city and vice versa. So the primetimers uh, for the primetime collective were, at the time, ranged from 61 to 94 had, again, like varying experience with the museum and with art. We didn't want people who were just diehard MoMA, you know, MoMA goers. We wanted people who didn't necessarily participate in arts programming or visit the museum or museums in general. Um, there was, I would say, as much as possible, we tried to involve individuals with uh, from a range of backgrounds and socioeconomic status, though I would say that our collective was primarily kind of a middle, upper middle class group, but which was still interesting to see their findings or their opinions on you know, the pricing at MoMA and the cost of participating in culture more broadly in the city. But what we asked these individuals to do was take part in a, an array of adult programming, um, most of it on site, some of it online, and to give us feedback on their experience and what they liked and what they didn't like, what, you know, what they would have hoped to have done, what they expected they would do, and how it you know, differed from what they expected. Um, and overall, they let us know that they were looking for programs that were engaging, which, you know, who isn't? But to have that written out is, again, very helpful when you're communicating internally about the kinds of experiences that you want to create um, that are inclusive, uh, that were social, and again, I think that social component that was highlighted through Meet Me at MoMA is part of all of the work that we do and has really translated for us across education and regularly scheduled, which is a, you know, 
not the most like mind blowing finding, but is really helpful in thinking that people want to know what they're getting into and they want to have something on the calendar. Um, and so that has informed how we have developed programs in the time since. They also identified various barriers to participation at MoMA or other cultural institutions in the city, primarily MoMA. Um, and those are not surprising either, but the number one one was a financial barrier. Uh, the senior ticket at MoMA is $18. And most adult programs had a fee or are free with museum admission. And so that's a big hurdle, especially if you live on a fixed income. Physical barriers, and just as our museum grows and grows and grows, we're getting more spread out, and it can be more and more taxing to visit the museum, so thinking about those kinds of considerations. Informational, and this is a big one, I think, and is something that we are still continuing to sort of work out internally, is communicating about our programs and presenting the information in a helpful, accessible way, especially for individuals who don't necessarily have broadband or a computer at home or are really sort of tech savvy the way that um, so many of us are. And there's just this sort of default mode to putting everything online. And, um, and I would say a big part of my job and really the job of my colleague, who is the primary liaison with Prime Timers, is, is, uh, is chatting and, and communicating over the phone and providing helpful guidance in a very accessible, kind of humanized, humanizing way for what is really a corporate intimidating institution. And then attitudinal, and these, these go hand in hand in, in a way. People perceive that they are less important through a number of means, um, be it through marketing materials uh, or the way that they're addressed when they come to the museum. Uh, there's, there's so many ways that we convey our biases, right? And so staff training and whatnot have been a big part, not just of the work around prime time, but also around the access task force overall. So in 2015, th all this piloting happened over the fall of 2014 and into the spring of 2015. And in 2015, May of 2015, because it was Older Americans Month, we had this launch event for, for prime time. And we brought in a marching band, which I still don't know why they let us do that, uh, which, which circumnavigated the, the block when you saw Vivian earlier with her sign. Um, so we had uh, our Primetime Collective and one of our Primetime Partner Organizations participate in this march um, and then came into the, into the garden. And then at one point, Vivian, who is the oldest of the Primetime Collective, she's now 96, just took the baton and started directing the band, which was, she also, when Francesca, my uh, supervisor, who's in the back holding Vivian's sign, was speaking and addressing all the visitors to the museum who were utterly confused as to why there was like a marching band inside the, the lobby. Um, Vivian then also just took the mic and <laughs> decided to, to share her input, which was phenomenal, right? Because she says everything better than I could ever say it, really. Um, but the launch event helped us to really build an audience. So, you know, because it was written up in the Times, and we you know, bought our spots on all the radio stations and whatnot, there was raised awareness that this was a new initiative for the museum. We were able over the course of the month of May to collect contact information for anybody who visited from New York who would like to be added to our mailing list and whatnot. And through that month long process, we had about 250 people sign up for the mailing list. Some signed up for MoMA memberships um, at a discounted rate. And we were able to, to really kind of build the audience through that. And so now we have two avenues of programming, which again, sort of mirrors the way that we've approached individual working with individuals with Alzheimer's disease or other uh, targeted access or community programming. We have monthly programs um, and it varies. So every month it's something a little different, but there's continuity in the sense that we have gallery conversations, which are very similar to Meet Me at MoMA. They're similar in size, in duration, in sort of tone, in focus, the way we slow down and only look at four or five works over the course of an hour and a half, you know, like very familiar ideas just applied to this broader audience. We have studio workshops, and there is a very devoted group of individuals who attend these studio workshops. And we also do film screenings, which I did not put a photo in because film screenings never look good on, in a photo, that are always followed by a conversation with one of the curators and one of our educators. Again, kind of trying to add this conversational social component to a visit to the museum. So each month we'll do one of these three things um, with the exception of a couple. We've done walking tours, which we'll do in the late summer, early fall. Um, and this month we have our primetime summer camp, which is for prime timers, uh, for individuals 65 and up. And it's our opportunity to serve many more people because what we've <laughs> found quite quickly through primetime programming is that there's an incredible demand. Um, and so at this point, all of our programs serve at least 90 people. 
so for the gallery conversations, we have six groups that go into the galleries. Um, and then for the studio workshops, we have six groups as well, about 15 people. And so for primetime summer camp, we offer, I think we have about like 16 different sections of classes happening throughout the week. And it also allows us to do multi-part programming, whereas because we're trying to serve as many people as possible, that's really the sort of the priority now that we're facing this demand through the monthly programs, we can only do these kind of one-off experiences. And so through the summer camp, we're able to serve more people. We have about 250 people registered for that. And, um, and people with varying interests, so some of them are art making, some of them are discussions, some of them will happen offsite um, at PS1, our contemporary affiliate, or at galleries in Chelsea. And we're able to do multi-part things that really allow people to develop new skills or, or try out new ideas and, develop, and work on them over the series of a few events. And then the other side of programming is our partnership programming. And this takes, I would say, four maybe different forms if you want to kind of put them into little buckets. So one of them is to still work, of course, with senior centers because they are a part of our community and, um, and do phenomenal work. And so we've prioritized uh, senior centers that are in the outer boroughs and also senior centers that serve an audience that are, that's typically underserved, both within aging services and within cultural, um, the cultural field. So for instance, this is an organization called SAGE, which is Services and Advocacy for GLBT Elders. And this is their Bronx site which is a, what their newest site. We saw that in the Times that they were gonna open this site in the Bronx and they had all these um, members who were traveling all the way into the city every day to go to a senior center where they felt welcomed, that they were part of a, a community that was, you know, spoke to their identity. And they wanted to develop this site in the Bronx and so what we decided to do was work with our, one of our artists, Carrie Downey, actually the same one who was dressed the same as one of our participants, um, to call artists, to put a call out to artists and pull people, this kind of artistic community, up to the Bronx. Um, and so that partnership has been going for the last three years and is very successful. And we work with other senior centers still around the five boroughs. Um, we also work in senior residences, including supportive residences. One of them is the Actors Fund, which is uh, an organization that serves individuals who worked in the performing arts at some point. So you have this like incredibly devoted art enthusiastic crowd um, and they have a number of residences primarily in Manhattan and Brooklyn so we partner with them to do work off-site but also residences for individuals who require more support who have a history of substance abuse or homelessness or sometimes you know a combination thereof which is not something you really think about I, mean, I think when we think about for instance the homeless population in New York there are certain assumptions we make about age um, military service etc and we have this big portion of uh, residents who are older. We also do a kind of distance learning, which is something that a number of museums do, working through teleconference programming, be it through Meals on Wheels or through the library systems in the city, um, or through this phenomenal program called the Virtual Senior Center, which is run out of a multi-service agency in Queens called Self-Help Community Services. And with this program, they self-help themselves went into a number of the homes of individuals who are no longer able to leave their home. and gave them a tablet, trained them on how to use it. They now log in on a probably daily basis to this virtual senior center and take part in all kinds of programs, some of which are cultural in nature, but others are, that are not. They're kind of book groups and um, news groups, current events, that kind of thing. Um, and you can kind of, you can see this is essentially like Google Hangouts where you have a conversation about works of art together as a group. And that of course allows us to reach people who could never, couldn't visit the museum physically. Um, and I think hopefully, because we also as a museum develop all kinds of online courses and whatnot, that this is, can be a gateway for people to access other resources that are available to them at MoMA or elsewhere. And then the last kind of program um, is something that's new and it's a pilot and we're working on it still. But it was mentioned yesterday that there is this trend, especially within the UK, of cultural prescription, wherein you will work with the general practitioners to essentially to prescribe, really, either particip participation in a museum or in some kind of art group. It extends out, you know, it's, it's part of a broader sort of social prescription movement where people will also prescribe a fishing group or like a mountain biking group or something like that, um, but as a means of combating social isolation. And this is an, an issue that we, you know, know is, is can be, that is, is more common in older adults than in other individuals. And so we've tried to pilot two models that are more of a referral-based system. It's not cultural prescription in the sense that was mentioned yesterday because of course we have a very different 
healthcare system than the UK, uh, don't we know it? But we work instead more with, on the one side, with, with a geriatric practice at the Martha Stewart Center for Living. She's not there. Um, and <laughs> we work with the, the social workers in that, in that group who identify patients within their base to participate in, in a program that is specifically for individuals with a history of mental health issues or who are at risk for social isolation. Um, and I hope, I think the idea is that we will expand that to work with more practices because I think there is a lot of, um, a lot of potential to, to reach more people. And then the other one, which this participant comes from, is through visiting Nurse Service of New York and their bereavement programming. So they offer hospice programs, and then uh, once someone has passed away, they offer bereavement services to for 13 months post-death to the family members. And so those family members will often go through a kind of process group together, and we have designed excuse me, a program that is meant to be sort of a bridge. So once you've gone through one of these process groups, you can then also, you're referred by the counselor who led that group to a multi-week sessions as a conversation program in the galleries. Very similar to Meet Me at MoMA and Tone and Style, very similar to the gallery conversations. Um, there's a lot of continuity, as I'm sure you can imagine, between these programs. But this is really meant to be a, a bridge um, where people can still gather with people who have had similar experience and, and in that kind of safe, comforting space, um, but do so in a new environment that, that gets them out into the community, into another institution, and brings up new topics of conversation that might not have necessarily been covered in this very intentional support grief, grief support group. Um, and so then the idea, too, with that is if you go through this, you can participate again in future sessions, but you can also then link into the other primetime offerings that we have. And so Shirley Freed is a woman who um, is incredibly immersed in her painting here. Um, and she came to us initially through this VNS partnership and has continued to participate in every single <laughs> primetime program in the time since. And um, and what's delightful, too, is that at one of the programs at a film screening, she actually ran into a friend of hers that she had known many years prior when Shirley and her husband and this woman, Aileen, and her husband um, were good friends, and they were like opera buddies. They would always go to the opera together. And they hadn't seen each other in years and years and years. And so this friendship kind of rekindled through the shared interest and also their shared loss. Um, and so there's so many opportunity f opportunities for kind of moments like that through these various outreach methods. And I will say the, these referral-based programs require much more work on our end. Um, and it is a really new model in the States. And, and it takes a lot of kind of communication and back and forth with the colleagues that we're trying to work with on the referral. So we've done a lot of um, meeting with, for instance, the group of bereavement counselors. We're gonna, they're going to come eventually when they can work it out in their schedules, because of course they're incredibly busy as well, to do a tour at the museum and kind of get a sense of that experience themselves so they can communicate about it more effectively when trying to refer patients. Um, but it's something that we're still working on, and I think we have a, there's a lot of, again, opportunity for this kind of programming to grow, and I hope we can get into like a good, solid place with it, because it's still very new. So the last thing I'll say is that um, aside from these programs that are for older adults, all free, uh, both in the community and at the museum, um, you know, we're, I mentioned that it's a sort of like bifurcated program, and what we're trying to do is find these kind of opportunities to not keep these two audiences sort of siloed, but to bring them together whenever possible. So the, the kind of transitional programs through VNS or Mount Sinai are an example of that. But we also work with our community-based partners to give advanced registration for primetime public programs because the registration fills up within like 20 minutes usually to get to that 90, <laughs> actually gets to 120 because we overbook. We're continuously looking for ways of, of um, of bringing people together in that way. It's, if you have any ideas, you know, I'm really open to hearing them because it's definitely still a work in process. And then we're also trying to make sure that we don't, again, just keep older adults in this kind of siloed primetime program, but expose them to all of the other offerings that are available at the museum. Um, so for instance, this is a program that our adult programs colleagues organized in the summer called Agora, which is a, a kind of an informal gathering in the garden where there's kind of one main question that is discussed over time. So you're not really looking, you're not an artwork, but you're discussing art or society more broadly. Um, and so trying to inform prime timers about these programs and give them the information they need so they feel welcome to participate 
um, or other offerings at the museum. This is something that we are still kind of continuing to work on and I find myself more and more acting as like a marketer as, <laughs> than I am as an educator. But I think these are, again, the kind of dual hats that we often wear when we work in this particular field. Of course, these programs, primetime programs, programming for people with Alzheimer's disease and their care partners um, are about reaching out to an audience um, that is otherwise underserved or, or doesn't feel necessarily welcome in the museum or represented within the museum. Of course, we want to reach out to people of varying backgrounds and ages and abilities because our publics are diverse, right? And so this is in some ways just a means of, of kind of, of justice and equity. But I think also through primetime and through the programming for people with Alzheimer's disease, our approach to working with older adults more generally is about creating a more positive and complex image about what life in this stage or with this experience can be like. Um, of course, we know there's rampant ageism, you know, in our society. And um, there are very, is very negative perception about what um, people are capable of. Um, and what people want to do, um, and what people's value are, is, or what people's value are. Um, and so this is very much about combating that and com contributing to a more complex, I would say too, um, not just positive, but a more complex image of, of life in this, these particular stages. And, you know, I don't, I'm preaching to the choir <laughs> in the sense that, um, that we're not, I think a lot of people are kind of fooling themselves, right, into thinking that these images or these issues don't affect them or that, that they're kind of immune from this. But of course, we all know that we're all aging. Um, and I think about, you know, what kind of world I would like to grow older in and what kind of opportunities I would like for be, to be available for me or to my parents um, in this stage of life. And it's, you want it to be a time of, of opportunity. And I think that's what we're all working towards. So thank you very much. I'm happy to answer questions if I still have time. Yes, I think there was a Judy. Uh, question, thought? Sure, sure. thought. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you haven't mentioned any specifically inter intergenerational programming, but you did say you're so interested in diverse uh, sure. groups coming together. So has there been an attempt to kind of connect with some schools that have a uh, pretty good structure in place for trips yeah. or uh, field trips for their students? And that some of those could be combined with the days your seniors mm -hmm. come in, and the children could interact with the seniors in the very same program you've already got set up. Sure. So. Yes and no, uh, which maybe it's not how the question was phrased. But um, so yes, we, we have thought about intergenerational programming. We've offered some. And I would say that that happens more often through the partnership programming than it does through the public programs. Because again, like with the registration for the public programs, when they register to 120 people in 20 minutes, I feel like we're really trying to prioritize the older, the prime timers for those programs. But so through partnerships, yes. And through the Primetime Collective, we actually, we did a pilot and then it was expanded to a broader teen course that was teens and older adults together, thinking that these are two groups that are misunderstood, right? And who feel that they experience ageism. Um, I'm a millennial, I don't really f f identify strongly with the millennial title, but, um, but you know, there's a lot of kind of assumptions that go in both directions. And so there was a really ripe partnership in that way and in, in, in sort of exploring those issues through art and representation and identity. One thing actually that came out of the Primetime Collective was that they did not necessarily want to do intergenerational programming, um, which is just to say, and I think partially it's how it can often be done, where there's an assumption that you need to bring older adults and kids together and, um, and then the, the kids will like feel like it's a service-oriented thing. I don't know that's not what you're saying, but I, I think you kind of see this when you look at the, the broader field. Um, and they were like, I don't, I don't want to talk about my grandkids. I don't want to hang out with my grandkids. Um, I, I'm not particularly interested in this. They were more interested in hanging out with other adults. And so I think that last bit of what I was saying about trying to involve older prime timers and, and either um, remove the financial barriers by providing scholarships to old, uh, aging sorry, adult programs like adult cor courses or just provide marketing kind of liaising to take part in the agoras, which, I mean, that last slide, there's like a real mix. I mean, you can't tell because you have the sign in the way, but the whole left side is like a much younger kind of adult di uh, co cohort on that side of things. So it's, I think it happens more through that 
linking up with adult programs that it does through working necessarily with schools. Um, yeah, to answer your question. Yes. So you mentioned that you lost your MetLife funding, mm -hmm. and you also mentioned that uh, the cost of getting to the museum was a barrier for mm -hmm. many seniors, mm -hmm. and the programs that you're offering were very expensive to me. Mm -hmm. So do you get additional funding? What, what are you doing to yeah. be able to provide this kind of level of program? Yeah. And I'm assuming you pay your artists. Yeah. Yes, we do. We pay the teaching artists. Of course, there's supply costs and, and whatnot. Um, all the programs are free. And and we, for prime time, got an initial seed grant from a small family foundation in the city. Um, that didn't cover anywhere near. <laughs> that was, it was very helpful, and it really allowed us to kind of move forward with it within the museum. But it, you know, it covered maybe a third of the operational costs for the prod for the programming. Um, so the museum has really just has has committed to this, and it's. Um, it's part of the budget and development fund raises for it. And so a lot of the funding comes out of the, the education fund, the general education fund, and um, then a few small kind of targeted foundations that really look at access on the, for the Meet Me at MoMA side of things um, and other access programs. So, so yeah, funding is still an issue for us, um, but luckily the museum is committed to covering, you know, whatever, whatever's needed. Yes. What else do you learn from the uh, collective in a sense? I think for my institution, people would say, well, you know, older people are coming to our programs anyway. Yes. So what else did they want that was different than your, than your regularly scheduled adult program? Yes, that, I'm very glad you asked that. Um, that was just to your first comment, that was the assumption, I think that's the assumption in museums, right? Is that like, oh, older adults already come to our museums. And I think it depends on where you are in your collection. And, you know, we have a, a meeting next week and a colleague from the Cooper Hewitt, which is a design museum on the Upper East Side, is going to talk. And she was like, no, this is really part of our bread and butter audience. Um, and so, it, you know, it's a different vibe there than it is at MoMA. But um, the, the collective said, well, A, they, they found that adult programming or the programs they participated in didn't have quite that kind of uniting social component. I, mean, I think that primetime really feels like a community because we do also exhibitions. We refer to people as, a, we like kind of in the emails like refer to them as a community, you know, I think, and that's just not the dynamic that you get through when you're just reaching out to the general public or it's not the adult programs dynamic or messaging. That was part of it. The the cost, again, that financial barrier because adult programs for the most part either are free with museum admission or have a separate admission, which is discounted for seniors. It's $5. But again, if you live on a fixed income, you're prioritizing in a certain way. And I think, too, there's something comforting about just knowing that people are sensitive to potential issues or needs that might come up. So I think, again, about we've been offering these primetime scholarships. Our, our colleagues who offer classes, which are normally about $350, um, have been offering a limited number of scholarships to primetimers, which is phenomenal. And we're really happy. And, you know, I open up the ap application process for that, and there's like 12 spots and, you know, 120 people apply. Um, so there's a demand. Um, but there are things that kind of come up in just the way that other programs are, are structured about like what kinds of stools people have or just they're so, they're, they sound so minor, but they are so important to the kind of experience that you create and what you communicate when then someone's like, no, I might need a stool with a back. And you're like, well, we don't, we can't bring one of those up to the galleries, you know, things like that. So it's, I mean, so that to me is, is not only reflect, is it more speaks to the work that we still have to do internally within our, our museum and our department to um, talk about these issues, not as accommodations, but really as a matter of equity um, and, and just a right to participation in the way that feels comfortable and fulfilling. Um, so, so I would say it's mostly, it's those kinds of tone aspects of the program that we're attempting to address. Yes. So I think in terms of managing expectations, again, there's like a tone thing where, I mean, I use exclamation points. 
Um, but yeah, th 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 this is like an exciting opportunity that we have. I think presenting it as an opportunity is is um, is key um, because I mean it is. It, it, you know, like ex visiting a museum, there's and having somebody to facilitate that experience is not something that everybody experiences or gets to um, have access to. So I think marketing it as a as an experience in that way. And then I think also the efforts that we have made again lately to try and um, share information about other things that are happening in the museum, which is something we're still sort of tweaking and, it, and is, provide, and is um, presenting some new challenges because you know we don't speak for those programs and so, but people sort of think we do. So messaging like who does what is, is a challenge for us because we're also a very big department and organization. Um, so yeah, but I, I think it really is through through just like an upbeat, positive tone. You know, like I remember we were a little nervous that the summer camp idea might seem like maybe potentially condescending, um, but we like got bags and we distributed these and they had these like very positive quotes on it or we featured MoMA, people on the MoMA blog in advance of that, Primetime or Voices. And so I think showing like just the, the way that we've sort of presented our, our programs and our um, participants, again, as like dynamic and vital and engaging and um, you know thought-provoking that those those are words that are used in like in literally every other aspect of museum programming so in some ways we're just borrowing from the bread and butter of the institution um, but it's not one they're not words that are often associated I think with this audience so you know it's not like revolutionary stuff but it's um, it's just more intentional any other la yeah I think just a comment about the summer camp idea don't underestimate People. Our docents offered what they call nude summer camp. Uh -huh. They looked at paintings of. Oh, nice. <laughs> I was wondering where you were going with that one. <laughs> there, are, there are tours for people in nude at some <laughs> I think Australia has. But um, yeah, so they're still talking about when they went to nude summer camp. Uh, yeah. Yes, and I think too. Um, the irreverence, right, that, that was talked about yesterday, this idea of like being a little cheeky or a little irreverent, like who wouldn't love that? You know, like we, again, like we use that tone with teen programs and with other programs and there's no reason not to do it here. And I think people appreciate, again, just being sort of addressed as, as people with a sense of humor. <laughs> Great, I think we should wrap. Thank you very much, I appreciate your attention. I'll do that. <laughs>